All right, guys, welcome to, is it already, I think it's already week six, we're getting to here. Um, and we're going to deviate a little bit from the schedule that's posted in the syllabus. Um, when I get a chance, I'll update the this uh, syllabus to reflect this a little bit. We're about one lecture behind. Um, and so I, I pushed these labs back a week and we'll do the the um, exam review um, will be given more as a um, we'll do some exam review in some way I haven't decided exactly what the rest of the schedule is going to look like um, I'm going to I'm trying to keep the midterm in week seven because having a midterm two thirds of the way instead of halfway through a quarter is um, would feel a little bit weird. Um, so I'm, I'm going to try, we're going to aim for still keeping that midterm next, next Thursday. Um, and the way that that will work is that basically you will have all weekends to take it. You will have one lecture and maybe that's what we'll do is we'll make the exam review, um, during the lecture on Thursday of next week. And then you'll have, instead of having a quiz, You'll have all weekend to take the, the exam, um, which will have a time limit on it. Um, it will be open note, but it'll still have a time limit on it so, so that you can't rely on just being able to um, brute force look everything up, spend you know 20 hours straight working on it. Um, it's going to be, and I'll, I will have a practice exam for you later this week so you know a little bit more what that looks like. Um, but so the the general plan though will be it will be a two hour test and I'll add about 15 minutes of padding on there um, to account for technology and getting stuff scanned. So you have about two hours to actually take the test that will be 10 parts, just like any of my other tests um, usually are. It'll be a little bit different because this this class doesn't lend itself to breaking stuff up into nice neat chunks the same way that um, that Gen Chem does. Um, but yeah, so you will do a review next Thursday and then all weekend you just have to to when you're ready, what you know, depending on your personality, if you're a morning person, which I sure hope you are to some extent, since this is an 8 a.m. lecture, um, but you could, you know, schedule yourself and take it first thing in the morning when you wake up. Um, you can take it at midnight if you wanted to. It's totally up to you, but it will be a two hour time limit on the test once you start it. Um, with that said, we're also going to push these, these labs back because we haven't started talking about substitution and elimination reactions yet. We haven't started talking about any reactions really yet, but we're going to get to that today. Um, so next week we will have these, maybe I'm still on the fence about whether we're even going to include these, um, they're labster simulations that are not totally useless, which seems like a contradiction. Um, for those of you who have done Labster Labs before, um, they're not that bad. They actually make some valid points and there's some some um, advantages to being able to do a Labster, uh, a Labster exercise because it does allow us to do things like put everything in um, or draw out the reaction mechanism in 3D. So you can actually see what's going on a little bit more cl clearly than um, just on a whiteboard. Um, and with that in mind, there's also some good resources that I put on the weekly overview for this week. Um, there's a website that what I think it's run out of the, at least it used to be run out of the um, University at, at Leeds in England. Um, that uh, has some really good 3D models. And in particular, let's say I don't think some of them don't let you um, go full screen here. Um, but what this one in particular is really helpful for is you can click and drag so you can visualize the cyclohexane from any angle that you like. Um, and then when you click over on the right hand side, it'll let you kind of go through the various conformers. And if you click the arrows here, it'll actually animate what that looks like. 
So you can see and you can add the, I believe there's a way to, to label the atoms so you can see which one is where. Hang on, let me throw my cat outside because she is being obnoxious. She's convinced she's ready to go hunt Stellar's Jays. The Jays are not so convinced that she could take them, but we'll see how that ends up. Um, so this is really kind of helpful, especially, and if you right click over on this applet, this Java applet is called um, JMOL. It's an open source um, applet that's Java applet that's designed to, to do chemistry stuff. And you can zoom in, you can move, move stuff around. If you right click, it gives you a bunch of options I'm just trying to get it to let's see, where is this is similar to something that um, that I used in grad school, but it's not exactly the same, which is why it does theirs labels. Um, I don't know exactly where everything is in this one. I used a slightly different version that we will get into in lab today. Um, but what this allows you to do is to see when you go, if you start in the chair conformer, I have to go back and add the label back on there again. Um, it doesn't keep the labels when it goes through the animations, but you can still kind of see how it, how it, when it shifts, it brings things with it and, and then switches from being axial to equatorial as you go through these. And so you can show an entire ring flip that way. Um, I also um, talked to Mariola. She got she got ten kits of um, of models um, assembled and ready for pickup. I believe with uh, with your names on them at uh, campus. Um, if you go, if you haven't been to pick up anything from campus yet, if you go around this. Um, around the side of the building. So not walking in through where, um, so that you walk by the boardroom and um, the math learning center. If you go around the side, kind of like you're going to the main entrance, there's a little side door to the library where they're doing pickups for student student materials. Um, and if, it, if they're not there yet, then by the, by the end of today, we should have um, a packet for each of you that wants to go pick one up with, with molecular models. And you're just, you know, you're going to be responsible for bringing them back. Um, trying, try to remember to bring back as as many atoms as we give you. Um, there is a list in each of the bags, but at the same time, if you're missing one hydrogen, we're not going to come after you and not let you register next quarter or something like that. But just so, just do your best. Um, so, and then I posted a few other. Um, a few other ones. Yeah. And if you would rather not be not feel worried about remembering to bring things back. Um, I got I got a set on Amazon on Friday that came on Sunday for twenty five dollars for two hundred piece set that had like twelve carbons and um, enough pieces that you can build just about anything you would need. Um, you know, you're not gonna be able to build a whole protein or something like that, but you can do, you know, your set a couple of cyclohexanes pretty easily um, for the sake of being able to demonstrate things like ring flips. And mine is now immediately has become a favorite toy of my children. So I have to make sure it's in the right configuration, but you can do things like, okay, if I've got this green and orange labeled, I can actually push it through a chair flip and get into the twist boat conformer and then flip this side up and get and you can actually see that you can manage to get the orange to go from being axial to equatorial um and so seeing some of those things and being able to take the the line drawings that we put on the border on your notes and turn that into a 3d object mentally so you can process that that's, they're a pretty helpful tool for that um, and let's see if I put a couple other resources in here. Oh, um, 
So our lab today, I posted the lab. Um, we're going to do a little bit of computational chemistry today, but I'm doing the, I did the lion's share of the heavy lifting for you guys. You guys will just have to actually run um, some calculations based on some coordinates that I that are in the assignment. Um, and you're going to do that using this this website called Web Games. Games G A M E S S um, is a is a open source computational chemistry program um, that uh, is used by a lot of researchers for um, doing things like calculating the energies of specific molecules, which is what you're going to do today. Um, and they have this version is set up so that for free on the internet, you can open up um, some coordinates, open up a molecule, calculate the energy of that geometry. Um, so you guys will actually make a potential energy surface today by taking these coordinates that I'm going to give you and calculating them, the numbers. I say calculating, you're not actually punching anything into a calculator. Um, you're going to take these coordinates in that are in my Dropbox and not attached here yet, um, that will be attached here soon, um, that look like this, that are basically a text document with a bunch of X's and Y's and the identity of what the various um, atoms look like. So this one is saying, here's a carbon atom with this X coordinate, this Y coordinate, this Z coordinate. And we copy and paste this and put it into um, web games here. And then we can, and then web games will take it and Um, when you then click read coordinates, it then opens it again in JMOL, just like the one, the animation I was just showing you, you can click and drag and look at it. So you'll actually calculate what the energy is for if cyclohexane stayed totally planar, we can calculate what the energy would be for that. And then we can compare that to the energy for a chair conformer. Um, and again, I'll, I'll walk through the process for that later, but that's going to be the bulk of today's lab is going to be looking at different conformers of cyclohexane, running some calculations, drawing some Newman projections, um, and then um, doing some analysis based on equilibrium, which we're going to talk about today. Ah, so let's go ahead and get started. There were, for the most part, it seemed like you guys were getting the hang of of um, doing the psych the stereochemistry, <clears throat> but uh, let's run through the quiz questions real quick. Um, and I did not realize when I made this. This is what happened. I was doing this in the middle of my of my Gen Chem lab, and they had questions, so I got distracted and forgot to de delete the random non answers in question one. Um, so hopefully you both, I think everybody realized nobody answered the or blank space for the multiple choice question here. So I think everybody figured out it was supposed to be A or B. Um, so I went back and gave everybody points. If you got the correct answer, which was a, which is a little tricky because it seems like with them being cis, this is a molecule that that they would be pointed in more or less in the same direction that that would be a problem and in fact if we look at the two different chair conformers here um we can see what the different options are so i'm gonna draw the two different chair conformers for a and then below that i'll draw the two different chair conformers for b so if we're looking at a We have, if we have cis di one three dimethyl, um, if we have the two positions that are not part of the ring on this top carbon are straight up in the axial position or over in the equatorial position, and then the the third carbon then has also has two positions. It has one that's going to be coming towards us 
and one that's going straight up. Right? So if we're if this is if we're looking at cis um, dimethyl cyclohexane, they need to be on the same side of the ring. So if we took the ring and flattened it out, we would need them to either both be above the ring or below the ring. So the two different positions that they can be in would be, we could have a methyl sticking up and that means this methyl would be sticking up. I realize I drew that squarely in the middle of the glare there, but that is the second methyl group which then if it went through a chair flip would look like it would flip the top section down. Which now looks is going to look like the methyl in the equatorial position. And this position, remember every, every time you go through a chair flip or a ring flip, everything switches from axial to equatorial or vice versa. So if it was axial, now it's equatorial. So for the cis version, we went, we have two possible conformers, one where they're both axial, which would be very, very unstable because you have those one, three diaxial interactions. And then you have one where they're both equatorial, which would be way more stable because now your big bulky groups are pointed away from everything else. And if we have, however, if we have the trans version of this, if we put the first one in the same position, our, our other methyl group then has to be in the equatorial position already because the other possibility would be that it was in this spot here. That would be the cis conformer. So the trans conformer or the trans isomer, we have one axial and one equatorial. And if we go through a ring flip, we move one of them into equatorial and the other one was already equatorial and is now axial. So between these, out of all four of these possibilities, these two are gonna be the same energetically, right? This one is more energy, this one is less energy. So that means that confirm that the isomer A, the cis isomer, is going to be the favored molecules lower in energy than the trans isomer because you can get both of your methyl groups into an equatorial position if you're starting as the cis isomer. So oddly, at least to me, it was odd. Um, a fair number of you guys got, roughly half of you guys got question one wrong, then almost everybody got question two right. So I don't know if you had trouble drawing question one, but question two was easier. Um, I would have expected that if, if half of you got question one wrong, half of you would also get question two wrong, um, but that's not what I saw in the answer. So um, was there something about this one that was easier or was it just, 50-50 shot and more of you guys got lucky on question two. They seem just as confusing when you did them. And you don't have to, that's a, that's a loaded question. You don't have to uh, raise your hand and, and answer that. Um, do you guys wanna go through number two though? Okay. Let's do it. And with us already having these drawn here for question two, we just have to add methyl group in the right position to each of these, right? So for question two, we had two that were two methyls that were on the same side, two methyls that were cis relative to each other for A, and one that was trans. So the 
the all completely cis version for B would look like would look like this. Our two get back zoomed in again. If we're gonna our two possibilities for this for carbon three here are either coming out towards us or straight things straight up. Our two possibilities for the carbon behind it are going away from us or sticking straight up. And so the, the one that would put all three methyls on the same side of the molecule would be if they were um, all above the ring structure. Then if we flattened it out, they would all be sticking up above the ring structure. Which means if we took this and then went through a ring flip, our other conformer would look like that. And I remember when I learned this, I, it was always really hard for me to visualize where the equatorial positions were, but it seemed a lot easier to try and visualize where the axial positions were. The axial positions just have to be pointed away from everything else, but straight up and down. So if you draw, if you're not sure where the equatorial position is going to be for any of these, draw the axial position first, and then draw the equatorial position in the last spot that's left. Um, so that was B. If I want to, and I should keep it consistent, I'll do A on the top again. So our two possible, our, if we're gonna have cis, cis, trans, we would have this molecule here where we have two axial methyl groups and one equatorial methyl group. And then when we go through a chair flip, we're gonna wind up with two equatorial and one axial. And if we stayed, if we looked at B, where they're all cis, we would have this molecule, where they're all axial, which would be unstable. But then if it went through a, a, a chair flip, that means all of them are now going to be equatorial. So that would mean putting one methyl here, one methyl there, and then we have this one drawn in equatorial position already. <coughs> Excuse me. So if we're trying to choose between these as to which one is more stable, they all have the same bonds. It's just a matter of which one can be arranged so that they're all equatorial, which is B. B can be arranged so that they're all equatorial. It would be this conformer here. All right, how are we feeling about these? Still a little shaky. That's okay, because that's what lab is today. Today's lab is dealing entirely with um, cyclohexanes and conformers, and so we'll get more practice with them today in lab. Get back to my screen share here. Um, as far as naming, you guys almost all got full credit on these. Um, the few places that people did tend to stumble were forgetting that you had to do R and S. Um, and then this one, 
we had a simpler way for naming this um, when it comes to some of you went through and named one of these carbons as R and the other carbon is S. Um, and we will practice how to name things with more than one stereo center today. Um, essentially, you just put a two or a three, you just put a number in front of it to say, okay, this carbon is R, this carbon is S. Um, but you didn't even need to do that for this one because all you had to say was cis dimethyl cyclohexane, cis 13 dimethyl cyclohexane. So, um, and again, we'll go through some more practice with that today. Um, we ended, I didn't go through naming these ones at the end of class on Thursday because we ran out of time. Um, these ones were, are already set up to be, um, for you to assign R and S to them, but they're not set up in a way that you can easily count the number of carbons or name them. Um, so it's good practice for going back and forth between those two possible ways to draw these. If we look at these molecules here, we can assign priority pretty easily when it's drawn like this, right? But then actually figuring out how, what's your longest continuous carbon chain is a little bit harder to visualize. Um, so you can, the way that I would approach this is I would assign R or S to each of these, and then I would redraw it as a skeletal structure. Take this and say, okay, see, this is an isopropyl group. That's a methyl, there's an ethyl, there's a methyl with a bromine attached draw it and then take that those pieces and put it together in a skeletal structure because then you can see a lot easier how to how to name the rest of this um so let's go through and do r versus s for these real quick for additional practice um i'll give you a head start while i clear my board So for this first one, when I'm going through and assigning priority, um, they're all carbons right away. So you have a you have a tie when you go to the first atom away from our stereo center. And then if we go one step further, this carbon on the left, the methyl group, the next step has to be a hydrogen, right? So and then everything else has a better choice has a higher atomic number choice compared to that. So our methyl group is gonna be our lowest priority. And if we, when we take one step for, past the first carbon, our best choice for this bromomethyl group is to a bromine, which is a much higher atomic number, right? So that would mean that our bromomethane is our highest priority. And then between these two, the isopropyl group and the ethyl group, they both are going to be tied again, right? If we looked at we took one step in the isopropyl direction, we get a carbon. In the ethyl direction, we get a carbon. If we go another step in the isopropyl direction, we get another carbon and another carbon. Keep that consistent, do it like that. And then if we take another step, we wind up with a hydrogen on both of them, no matter where we go. So we've got a tie. If you get to the end of your branch, and it's a tie, 
you go back and you do it again and you have to take a different route this time. So if we're going the different route, we still we have to go carbon. It's in carbon, so it's still a tie. But then we, if we can't go the same way on our ethyl group, our second step has to be to a hydrogen. And here, our second step can be to another carbon if it's the isopropyl. So that would mean the isopropyl is higher priority than the ethyl group. getting cold outside these days. I'll be honest, I'm not really ready for winter yet, I don't think. All right, so then, so that's how we decide the difference between two and three. It's not based on which one is the higher total mass. It's about which one is you can break the tie in as few steps as possible between the two sides. If you wind up trying to assign priority between the two branches and no matter what you do, you're getting a tie, your two branches are probably the same. And if your two branches are the same, then you don't actually have any stereochemistry there because you have two identical substituents, right? So there has to be a difference between them or so you have to be able to assign priority or there is no R versus S. So for this one, we assign priority that way. And then it's a matter of, OK, we need to put the fourth one in the back where number three is. So we're going to take this whole thing and we can spin the bottom three the bottom three substituents like a propeller to put four where three is and that so then that would look like two stayed in the same spot four rotated back to where three is one rotated over to where four was, and three is now coming out towards us. So now with four in the back, we just draw our arrow, one to two to three, it's clockwise, so it's R. All right, so then um, would you get a different result if you spun it off of a different axis? Can you even do that? No, you would not get a different result as long as you did it properly. So and by what I mean by that is you have to make sure that you're rotating it and not just switch. If you switch any two things, if I just switched three and four and left one and two where they were, that's going to give me the wrong answer because that's not spinning it, that's just grabbing things, pulling it apart and reattaching them. So you're always gonna have to spin it, rotate it one way or the other in order to do this right. Um, as far as naming the rest of it, once we get there, now we can look at this and say, okay, I've got an isopropyl group and then a carbon and then an ethyl group. So if I start by drawing a skeletal structure that looks like an isopropyl group to a carbon, and then these each have one carbon. So and then an ethyl. And then attached to this one was also was the bromine. So we want the longest continuous carbon chain that has the bromine on it is going to be our easiest way to name this. And so our longest continuous carbon chain that has the bromine attached has to start or end right here, right? So one, two, three, four, or one, two, three, four. 
would make it the easiest if we went this way. And I should switch color there. So I can get four in a row if I go this way. It wouldn't be wrong to go this other direction. You can still get four in a row that way, but then we have to name this as an isopropyl or as a methyl ethyl. And so we have a more complicated branch. If we pick our main carbon group properly, we have it, an ethyl, a methyl, and a methyl, as opposed to having to use parentheses. A little bit of personal preference there. That way it just looks easier to me. So Sean. Yeah. Um, when we're drawing the skeleton structure, we want to draw it off of um, what you give us, not like our our um, like priority, but not based off of the priority that we just did. So the I mean, priority was just to determine R versus S. Okay. Once we've done that, if you if you wanted if you did a really careful job of drawing it ro rotated properly and you want to draw your skeletal structure from the rotated version, that's totally fine. It should give you the same answer. Right. Um, there's like I said, but it's going to give you the same answer. So take your pick. Okay. Um, so then once we get this drawn, now we can name it all in a way that's going to be very similar to the way we would normally name these. So it would be this first one would be R which Microsoft always tries to autocorrect as to copyright reserved or whatever. Um, and it's going to be 2,3-dimethyl. Two ethyl one bromo butane would be the full name for this one. So again, nothing nothing in that's that different than what we've done before. It's just a lot of our rules stacked on top of each other for this molecule. Um, if you if you drew your and went the dotted line way, it would be something like um, two, me, two methyl, two parentheses methyl ethyl or two isopropyl one bromobutane instead which would be just as, as technically correct. Actually, Sean, I have a question about that. I'm confused. Why aren't we choosing the five chain? Because we want the longest continuous carbon chain that has the bromine on it. Oh. So if we oh, started okay. here and went around the other way to get to five in a row, we would, you technically can, can do that as well. There's a rule for how you could name a complicated branch that has a halogen on it. You could call it a, in parentheses, bromomethyl group. Um, but our hmm. rules for functional groups say that we want the longest continuous carbon chain that has the most important functional group on it. And for now, our most important hmm. functional group is just the halogen. Gotcha, somehow I missed that. All right, thank you. No problem. I had the same question. I I plugged it into Moldview and it came up with the bromo methyl version with the five carbon chain, but I understand what you're saying. And so what, what we're going to find out that um, halogens are not a super important functional group. They're very low priority when it comes to how, naming these things. And so um, I'm just getting you guys in the habit of, of whatever your most important functional group is has to be on your parent mo molecule has to be on the main carbon chain um, because that's going to really matter when we start doing things like alcohols and carboxylic acids and aldehydes. Those all have to be on the main carbon chain. Um, so I'm just getting you guys used to the fact that we want, even if there's a longer way we can count number of carbons, that rule goes out the window when we bring in things like al an alcohol functional group. 
So just in the interest of consistency, even though bromine is not a super important functional group, we're going to use the same rules here. Um, if you did name it the other way, it would be something like, it would then be a pentane, it would be two, three, dimethyl, three parentheses, bromomethyl, pentane, still with the R in front. And again, this way is a little bit less consistent with our rule of put every, keep our branches as simple as possible. Put your, um, your most important functional group on the main carbon chain. So I would prefer this one, but if you did, if you wrote it this way, um, then I wouldn't necessarily mark you wrong if it's just a bromine but if it was a hydroxyl you can't do that if it's an oh group you have to name it the other way so in the interest of consistency i'd go this way I'm trying to make you guys learn as few different versions of the nomenclature rules as possible um because there are a lot of them out there all right i'm not going to go through Actually, well, it's, it is break time already, but um, I will, let's do a few slides of vocab basically and a couple different concepts real quick, and then we'll take our break. Um, if we have more than one asymmetric center, if we have more than one different place that, that you can have a stereoisomer, we would just, we usually just name them um, by putting a number in front of the R versus the S. So for instance, if we have um, this molecule here, we've got an OH group on cyclohexane and a methyl group on cyclohexane. We have two different carbons that each have four different substituents because this ring structure is two different substituents because there are two different ways you could go around the ring, right? you can tell which way you're going around the ring. You can go towards the methyl or away from the methyl. If, the, if it was totally symmetrical, if the methyl was over here, that wouldn't be two different substituents because either way you went around the methyl, it would take you four steps to get there, three steps to get there. But because there's the close way and the far way, that's two different substituents. There's, you can tell the difference between the two different carbon-carbon bonds that are on the ring. Um, and so this carbon here, the carbon with the OH attached to it, is a stereo center, as is this one. And if you take the mirror image of this molecule, you wind up with both of them being flipped. You go from 1R2S to 1S2R. So if you take the mirror image of this, both of them have to be flipped. However, that means that there's also another stereoisomer, another pair of stereoisomers in this case, where you flip one of the stereo centers, but not the other. So here they're, the two substituents are cis, right? And both of these versions, it's two different molecules because you flip you the uh, stereochemistry, but they're both cis either way. Here they're trans either way. And so you can have, instead of 1R2S, you can have 1R2R, which is not a mirror image of this one, right? That's not a mirror image because a mirror image, we would have to flip both of the stereo centers. Here we only flipped one of them. which seems confusing. If you want to think about what that would look like in terms of our hand analogy. So your right hand is a, left, is a mirror image of your left hand, right? They're enantiomers. If you have 
what part of the symmetry flips, but not the other half, that would be like taking your left thumb and putting it on your right hand. Your thumb would now be backwards, but the rest of your fingers would be the same. Not a mirror image anymore, right? Um, and so if you have something that's a stereoisomer, but it's not a mirror image, we have a different name for it. We call that a, a distereomer, right? So an enantiomer means mirror image. Distereomer, which is spelled, there we go, just behind the image there. Um, diastereomers are are stereoisomers that are not mirror images. So you flip one one stereo center, but not the other. Right. So if it's an enantiomer, and if you're not sure, it's not always as easy to see as these ones. I could draw versions of these that were a lot tougher to see, but if you assign your priority right, if it's an enantiomer, then they both have to be flipped. So if it was R1, R2S, it has to be 1S, 2R. If one of them's flipped, but not the other, so 1R, 2S to 1R, 2R, that means it's a diastereomer. All right, if you think about it in terms of flipping coins, if you're each of these stereo centers has two possibilities, right? It has R or it has S. If I if I flipped coin twice and I got two heads, the mirror image of that would be getting two tails, right? The diastereomer version of it was if I got two heads, would be flipping one of them over, but not the other. So instead of two heads or two tails, I have one head and one tail or vice versa, right? So that the difference again is you're flipping one but not the other to get a diastereomer. We'll come back and do this in a second. I wanna just do one more concept piece of vocab to let it marinate over our break. This is the reason why you didn't have to assign priority for that last preferred problem four, is if you have a compound that has a mirror image in the middle of it, it has a, a plane of symmetry in the middle of it, that's a specific type of compound because, because it has that internal line of symmetry, if I took the mirror image of this, if I took this and did the mirror image of it, I get would get this molecule, right? But that's really just the same as taking the, the one where they're both pointed towards us and flipping it over. We could take this, this molecule and just flip it over like a pancake and we get the molecule on the right. So in other words, when we took the mirror image of this one, we don't get a non-superimposable mirror image, which was our definition of an enantiomer, is the mirror image is not the same molecule. So the other way of an, a 3D example of this would be like, so we've always, we've been using right hand and left hand, right? Um, a mirror image might, Let's see, what's a good, a good example? I thought I had one and then I realized that was just plain wrong. Um, it, let me think of that, about a good example of that. It's something where if you take the mirror, it'd be like our chair. If you take the mirror image of, your, of a chair, it seems like the chair has a right hand and a left hand, so it should side. So when we take the mirror image of it, we should get a, different object. Most things that have a right hand and a left hand and a front and a back, when you take the mirror image, you get something different on the other side, right? But what, 
with a chair, when you do that, you take the mirror image of a chair, you can just take the mirror image and turn it and twist it around because it has an internal mirror plane where the right-hand side of the chair is identical to the left-hand side of the chair because you can just reflect it across the middle and get the same thing on the other side. Right, so if it doesn't have an internal mirror plane, we have R versus S and we can get two different versions of it. If, if the top half of the molecule looks the exact same, is a mirror image of the, the bottom half of the molecule, it's a meso compound. And so you could even just say meso, one, two, dimethylcyclohexane would be one way of, of um, writing the name for the molecule in question four, where these were both methyls. Or you can just say cis. If they're not the same substituent, though, you don't have an internal mirror plane. If you don't, because now the top half does not look the same as the bottom half. And now when we take a mirror image, we get different molecules. You guys see the difference between those? Because these two things are different, it's not meso. Which means we only get three possible stereoisomers here, despite the fact we've got two distinct stereo centers, carbon one, carbon two, could each be R or S. But because two of the possibilities are the same molecule, we only get three possible stereoisomers. Let's take our break there. We'll come back and start with this slide. Um, let's come back at five after, and then we'll get into energy and entropy. Fun stuff.
Hey, Sean. Yeah, what's going on? Um, quick question. Do you know why my quiz five would be the grades dropped? Like it's, it says it's like not counted in the score or like my overall. Um, Cause you get to drop one quiz, your lowest quiz grade gets dropped. Okay. I have lower ones. <laughs> um, then it's possible that I, when I made it, I put it into the assignments category instead of the quiz category. Ah, uh, okay. So I'll, I'll take care of that real quick. Okay. No problem. Thank you. Thank you. Olivia, if you hit refresh now, it should be fixed. Okay, thanks a bunch. I'll check it out. All right, let's go ahead and come back here. <clears throat> and look at whether or not we can define these as enantiomers or diastereomers. So remember our definition of diastereomer was means it's a different molecule, but it's not a mirror image. <clears throat> so for this first one, we have three possible stereo centers, right? We've got one, two, three are all different stereo centers. These, the first ones, the first two are a little easier to see because we're that's what we've been dealing with. This last one, you might have to um, double check, but it's got a methyl, an OH group, a hydrogen, and then the rest of the molecule all attached here. So it's got four different things attached. So then our question is, if it's an enantiomer, all of those have to be flipped. If it's a mirror image, all three of the stereo centers have to be flipped. And what we see, if I clear the ink here, is that the stereo center with right here is flipped because we kept the ring structure in the same position and then we switched the OH and the hydrogen. So that one's flipped. This one is flipped for the same reason. We kept the ring structure the same and then we switched the hydrogen and the in the fourth substituent. But this one is drawn the same on both of these, which means it's not flipped. So if we have two of them flipped, but not the third, it can't be an enantiomer because to be in an antimer, all three of them have to be flipped, have to be reversed. And since one of them is not, then it's a diastereomer. Let's do, let's look at this other one here. And these ones, the other, the third option is that it's a fully different molecule, right? That's a different isomer of the same, where it's uh, not just the stereochemistry that's different. So we do want to double check that we actually have the same number of carbons in a straight ch chain. So this one is drawn in a really easy way. This is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So it's octane. It's going to be dimethyl octane, right? And this one, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So still dimethyl octane, still three, four dimethyl octane. So then, so it's either an enantiomer, it could be the same molecule. So there are four options, different isomer completely 
the same molecule in antimer or diastereomer. It's not a different isomer completely because they're both 3,4 dimethyl octane. So then it could either be a mirror image, it could be the same molecule if our stereochemistry doesn't change at all between the two, or they could be mirror image if they both flip, or it could be a diastereomer if one of them is flipped. Right, so for this first one, if we're assigning priority for this first stereocenter right here on the left hand side, our highest priority is going to be over here. This one, two is the ethyl group, three is the methyl, and then four is the hydrogen drawn that's not drawn that's facing towards us. All right, you guys comfortable with the priority there? I know I went fast on that, but we know that the hydrogen that's not drawn is towards us because we have two bonds that are flat and the one going away from us. So the bond that's not drawn has to be coming towards us and it has to be a hydrogen. So that means there, when we have one like this and we don't wanna take the time to to fully redraw this out. One way to do this is if you have the hydrogen sticking towards us instead of away from us, if you can visualize leaving the molecule exactly where it is, step through the screen and look at it from behind. Because if the hydrogen is sticking towards you and then you, you walk around the molecule and look at it from the other side, now the hydrogen is away from you, right? Or in other words, if you if you have the hydrogen sticking straight towards you, if you draw your arrow and then you're just gonna flip whether it's R versus S. That takes a little bit more to see. So if I'm, the way it's drawn right now, if I'm looking at my screen, I would draw my arrow clockwise, right? One to two to three, but that'd be backwards because the hydrogen's pointing towards us instead of away. So if you move your finger in a clockwise direction and then look at it from the other side, keep it moving in a clockwise direction, now it's going counterclockwise, right? So if, if it looks clockwise, but the four is towards us, then it's really counterclockwise because we need to look at it from the other side of the molecule. So that would indicate that this one that the first stereo center here is S. And over here, our first stereo center is R. The ethyl group's in the same spot. The methyl group is up. And then the rest of the molecule is off to the right. So one, two, three. So it's still one, two, three, except now the hydrogen's away from us. So now when we drew, move your finger in a clockwise direction, you don't have to look at it from the other side. You're already facing the right way. So the first stereo center is flipped. We went from S to R. And now if I clean this up, I'll leave as much of this as possible or leave just enough so we can remember that we went from R to S. Now let's do the same thing for the second stereoisomer. So the second stereoisomer, this one's a little tricky to, to assign priority because it's not just the biggest side. I guess it is, yeah, it's gonna go one, two, three, four. So our highest priority is going to be here, then here, and actually I should switch. So 
switch colors here so we can tell the difference. One, two, three, and then the hydrogen that's not drawn this towards us is four. So one to two to three, that would be counterclockwise, but we're looking at it from the wrong side. So if it's counterclockwise, and then you look at it from the other side, it's clockwise. So the second stereoisomer here, or the second stereo center is R on the first example. Then on the second one, we already assigned priority. We just, things are just arranged differently. So we get, that was three, this was two, this was one, and the hydrogen is coming towards us again, is four. So one to two to three would be clockwise, but we're looking at it from the wrong direction. So that would mean this one is S in this version. So we went from red S to red R and blue R to blue S. So we flipped both sides. So that tells us it's an enantiomer. And if you're still struggling with the assigning priority and getting R versus S, I know I went through that fast, but when you come back through and check your notes later or try and do this on your own or watch the video, you should be able to get, get these. I'm pretty sure I didn't mess up anywhere. I've gotten pretty good at this. I'll although it did take a few years. All right, but so do you see the difference between these two as well? The left-hand side, two of the stereo centers were flipped, but not the third. So it wasn't a mirror image. On the right-hand side, both of the stereo centers were flipped. So it was a mirror image, even though it's not drawn like a mirror image. The right-hand one, it's harder to see. If I drew the right-hand one, the easy way to see it, would look like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. If I took this and just drew it with both of them as wedges, and they were both, everything's in the same position, I just switched the wedges for dashes, right? This is, now this is really easy to see because all I did was flip, flip where these were. So if it was going away from us and now it's coming towards us, I flip the stereo center. So if it's drawn where everything is in the same position and you just flipped your wedges and dashes, it's easy to see whether you flipped it or not, whether it's an enantiomer or not. When it's drawn in a more complicated way, like on the right hand side, where it's not identical to what you had drawn over here it's a little bit harder and the easiest way to see is usually to assign priority and see if you flipped both of them that way. All right. Good news is, is that the rest of today's lecture is, I don't know why I'm going to the trouble of erasing all this um, other than my OCD tendencies. Um, the rest of today is going to be pretty much all review from Gen Chem. We're going to approach it from a slightly different point of view, but all we're going to be talking about the rest of today is free energy and equilibrium constants. So delta G and entropy. So we're going to define some of these terms a little bit differently. <clears throat> um, back in Gen Chem, depending on who you had for um, for when you start talking about enthalpy, I, I usually define enthalpy in Gen Chem as just being bond energy. It's the energy that's in a bond. 
when, when you make a molecule. So when you make a bond between two atoms, you made it more stable. The amount of additional stability that you get when you make that bond is the enthalpy. And so the, an OCHEM definition um, might be, it's the amount of energy needed to break a covalent bond homolytically, meaning that you're splitting it up into two free radicals. You're not just breaking a bond. Each of those atoms is taking the electron that they first brought with it. So instead of having a bonding orbital where you've got that's occupied by two electrons, you're splitting it into two atomic orbitals, each of which has one electron. All right. So bond energy is not a bad way to think about this. It's the amount of energy that's in the bond itself. And so the enthalpy for an entire molecule is the sum of all of these bond energies. Um, this is also called bond. If we're talking about an individual bond, it's more frequently called bond dissociation energy. And that's just saying, if I totally broke this bond apart, how much energy do I have to put in? Um, so this is, there are, are lots of different tables you can find that actually just have um, these, these bond energies in them. And so if we wanted to know what the overall change in energy was for, for a reaction, we can just look at the bonds that we had before and the bonds that we made afterwards or in the course of the reaction, and we can just total up, all right, I had to break these three bonds, so that cost me this much energy but then I made these three other bonds and that's gonna give me this much energy back. And look at what the total change in energy is just by looking at the difference in bond enthalpies but, um, from one side to the other. Um, this top figure is just showing the difference between homolytic cleavage would be if you split a bond and each atom took one electron with it. A, what's more common in OCHEM is a heterolytic bond cleavage where one of your atoms is more electronegative than the other. And so one of your atoms winds up taking both electrons with it instead of just one. Um, that's just to define these homolytic versus heterolytic terms. Um, and so these different tables are going to give us a good way to estimate just by looking at the structures before and after, we can estimate what the enthalpy is for an entire reaction, just by saying, okay, I broke two carbon hydrogen bonds, but I made a hydrogen hydrogen car bond and I made a carbon carbon bond. And any, any bonds that you make are going to give you energy. They're more stable. So that's gonna be downhill in energy or negative enthalpy and any bonds that you break, you have to put that energy into the system. So you have to add energy to do that. So the sum of all of this, the overall change in energy and bond energy for a reaction is what we usually write as Delta H, right? Which should look familiar. Delta H from GenCam was basically how we just decided whether it was an exothermic or an endothermic reaction. Because if your delta H was negative, if your chemicals lost energy in the bonds, that energy had to go somewhere. So it goes to the surroundings and it warms them up. If you had to put in additional energy to break the bonds, if it's uphill in energy to break the bonds, that's a positive delta H because you're products now have more energy than the reactants did. And so that's an endothermic reaction. That's going to be a reaction that you have to put energy in. Or conversely, the other way to think about it and the way that you guys are used to think about endothermic reactions is it makes the surroundings colder when this reaction happens. But you guys hopefully see that those are two sides of the same coin. If it makes the surroundings colder when this happens, the other way of thinking about it is you have to put energy into the chemicals. So anything that you have to heat for a reaction to happen, 
is frequently going to be endothermic. It's like boiling water. Water doesn't boil on its own, even if it's 100 Celsius, right? If water is 100 degrees Celsius, you still have to keep heating it for it to boil, for that phase change to happen, because that phase change is an endothermic phase change. And so one of the ways we can use these bond energies, the easiest way to do this, maybe not the easiest way, but the, the simplest conceptual way to do this, rather than calculating the energy of the entire molecule before and after, is to just look at the bonds broken and the bonds being formed. So if we have this reaction that's happening here, we have methyl propane plus, um, plus chlorine turns into two chloromethylpropane and HCl. If we want to know delta H for this reaction, all we have to do is look at the bonds that we're breaking and look at the bonds that we're forming and we just add everything up. The key is remembering you have to add energy to break bonds. So that's a positive number for the enthalpy. And you're going to get that energy back when you make bonds. So if we are looking at what we're, what we are, what bonds we're breaking, what we're forming, Cl2 is really Cl covalent bond Cl, right? And the bond that's being broken here is a carbon hydrogen bond. So we're breaking these two bonds and we're making a carbon chlorine bond and we're making an, an HCl bond. And if we wanted to total those up, wrong button. So bonds broken are going to be the carbon hydrogen bond, which is 381 kilojoules per mole. And that's, we're breaking it. So it's a positive 381 per mole. And the chlorine, chlorine, we're breaking, and so it's a positive 243. Then we're forming a carbon chlorine bond, and we're forming it, so it's going to, we're going to get that energy back, so it's a negative 331. And we're making an HCl bond. So it's a negative 431. So if we want to know delta H for this reaction, we just add all that up. So I said there wasn't going to be much math for this class. The extent of the math is typically stuff like this. You just have to add numbers. You don't need a super fancy calculator to do it. We should get, so our delta H, and I might as well make it look right. So delta H for the reaction is going to be, we're going to get plus, what's 381 plus 243? We're going to get something 620, 624. 
and then minus, so that's going to be 62, 762. which is going to add up to negative one. Somebody's figured it out. Thank you. Negative 138. So it's really a lot like doing your delta H of formation values from Gen Chem, right? Except to do the delta H formation values, you have to have the values in a table somewhere. And then you just do products minus reactants. The problem with using that approach in OCHEM is that there are, there are not very many tables that have every possible OCHEM compound. If you remember the tables at the end of your, your Gen Chem textbook, there was maybe a page of, of carbon-based compounds, which you guys already know how to name way more than that as far as just sheer number of molecules. And so you can't just look up delta H of formation values all the time. Sometimes the best way to do this is to just look at the bonds breaking and the bonds being formed and add them up that way, because this is a much smaller table. Finding these kind of tables are is a lot easier than finding a very specific compounds delta H of formation. And Plus, if you were doing OCHEM research, if this was your job and you and you were working with chlorine all the time, you probably in the back of your head have a number rattling around for the bond dissociation energy for carbon hydrogen. So you can ballpark this on the back of an envelope if you have some of these common numbers memorized, even if they're just ballpark numbers, you can at least predict whether something's going to be exothermic or endothermic without the need to even go find a table which is pretty helpful. Again, that's going to be if you're working in this field, it's one of those things where once you start working in this field, you have certain numbers, you just wind up memorizing because you use them all the time. If you're used to serving at a restaurant, you have probably have the price of drinks memorized in your head, right? Not because you sat down with, with flashcards to memorize them, just because you use it all the time. Although, I don't know. I've never actually been a bartender, so I don't know if you sit down to memorize prices of drinks or not, but I don't, recipes maybe, probably not prices. That's what computers are for, right? Um, we're gonna go a step past enthalpy. So enthalpy is our bond energy, but enthalpy does not tell the whole story necessarily when it comes to whether or not things happen spontaneously. Because we can have spontaneous processes that happen that don't that aren't exothermic at all or exo aren't exothermic or endothermic necessarily. And so we need more than just looking at the bond energy to determine whether a reaction will happen because the other aspect of it is why would a, a reaction be spontaneous if it's uphill in energy? How, come, how could we have a reaction happening that makes the surroundings colder at room temperature? Why would that happen spontaneously if the only piece of the picture is enthalpy that's uphill in energy? Why would that happen? And so the other piece of it is going to be disorder or entropy, right? And so this is a really common example that gets used. You just have a gas, an inert gas in one side of the system, and there's a valve, and then you have a vacuum on the other side of the system. If you open that valve, it will spontaneously turn into the gas being spread between both sides of the system, right? No bonds are being broken. That's not downhill in, in enthalpy because there's we didn't break any bonds. But it'll still happen spontaneously. And the flip side of that is if it's a spontaneous process, it's going to be non-spontaneous the other direction. If you started, where, where's my pointer? Um, if you started with this system, you could not, you would never expect it to spontaneously rearrange itself to look like it was up here, right? That's almost, 
absurd to think about some at, there is some finite possibility that that could happen that randomly all of the gas molecules on the left hand side find themselves on the right hand side by sheer chance but that'd be so the the odds of that would be so infinitesimally small that we can basically say that that won't happen and even if it did happen it wouldn't last it would right away be back to where it was so if it's spontaneous in one direction, it's going to be non-spontaneous the other direction unless you change conditions. So there's something about the conditions themselves are also going to govern whether these are spontaneous processes. Another good example is a nail rusting or a car rusting. If you take a car and it starts getting rusted out, it's not going to spontaneously unrust itself, right? There are ways you can force the reaction to go backwards um, by applying a large amount of voltage to it and setting everything up just right. You can actually get a car to be restored or take a piece of a nail and unrust it that way. But you have to change the conditions pretty significantly to do so. Um, and this is mainly due to this, what's called the second law of thermodynamics. And the second law of thermodynamics says for, for a reversible process, meaning a, a process that's at equilibrium or that's changing very, very gradually, and the, the mathematical definition says infin, infinitesimally slow, infinitely slowly, um, you can have a reversible process be spontaneous. Um, and so for a reversible process, they say the second law of thermodynamics says that the entropy of the universe is equal to zero. All reversible processes don't exist in the real world though. And so almost everything is going to be an irreversible process. And for irreversible process, the entropy of the universe has to be increasing. If something happens, it's because the entropy of the universe is increasing. If the entropy of the universe does not increase, then it doesn't happen. It's a non-spontaneous process. And so our definition of entropy comes from Ludwig Boltzmann, um, who came up with the concept and described it on the molecular level and basically just said that it's it's the number of different possible states that you can have it's a number of possible ways you can arrange things is defined as your entropy and so that's actually what this w is this is actually boltzmann's tomb or his grave on his his epitaph on his gravestone is literally the equation for entropy um because he's hardcore like that. Um, I don't know if I if I discovered something and if I got a whole constant named after me that everybody for the next hundred years was going to have to be dealing with, I might have put that on my gravestone too. You never know. Um, w is just literally the number of possible outcomes. It's defined molecularly as the number of microstates, and that means like the number of possible positions a molecule can be in. So gases have a large number of a large W because there's a tons of empty space in a gas, right? There's not that many gas molecules for a given volume. And so as a result, W is really, really big for gases. Um, for liquids and solids, W is a lot smaller because for liquids, they have to be confined to a certain area and there's other molecules in the way. For for solids, they're confined to a certain area and they can't even move around, right? They're stuck in a lattice. And so that entropy is really of solids, liquids, and gases kind of makes a fair bit of sense. Um, also worth noting that this is always true. There's no exceptions for an irreversible process. 
that doesn't mean that you can't have delta S be negative for the system. You can have delta S for a system be negative. You can make things more ordered for a system. It's just going to be as long as the sum of these two numbers is greater than zero. So the, the entropy of the surroundings has to be increasing by more than your system is decreasing. Right, and so this is why this people that haven't taken a science class will sometimes use the second law of thermodynamics as proof that God exists. Because we are ordered, therefore we had to start from a more ordered state and be moving towards a less ordered state. And so therefore we had to have a creator that's made us ordered. That's not what this says, right? With leaving out whether or not God exists, you can definitively say this does not prove God's existence because the earth is not a closed system. The earth is a system that is get, being given energy constantly from the sun. The fusion in the sun is increasing the entropy of the universe by more than we are decreasing the entropy by evolving on earth. So the entropy of the universe is still increasing, even if locally on earth, there are certain things happening that are caught that are forming more ordered states. Right. So unless you're looking at the universe as a whole, you can't use the second law of thermodynamics to say anything about the existence of God. Right. So it's, it's just doesn't belong in there. Um, one interesting way of thinking about entropy, though, is it's basically our brains, our brains way of processing time is essentially time is is a variable where we can move in only one direction. Right. We can only move forward in time because moving backward in time would mean we are going to a more ordered state. We would be reversing the second law of thermodynamics if we went backward in time. So entropy forces time forward because we can't go back to a more ordered state in the universe. So in some, so our, bot, our brain's perception of time is basically measuring the entropy of a system. And you can think about this, if I showed you two pictures, if I showed you a picture of a, of a vase full of flowers on a table, and then I showed you a picture of a vase on the ground broken with the flowers scattered everywhere, you, you would know which one was first, right? Your brain inherently knows how to arrange things based on entropy. You know which one comes first because the flower, the broken vase is not going to spontaneously turn back into being unbroken and sitting on the table, which is kind of a cool concept. All right, where does this apply to OCHEM? Is when we take the second law of thermodynamics and use it to define something that allows us to predict spontaneous reactions. Right, and the way we do that is we start from this rule here. Delta S of the universe is equal to delta S of the system and delta S of the surroundings, which is a really, really basic thing to say. You've got change in entropy for the universe it has to be made up of two pieces, the stuff you're looking at and the stuff around it. Literally, the rest of the universe is surroundings. System is what we care about. Surroundings is literally the rest of the universe. When we put it that way, yeah, it's it's like all those things. Like there are two types of people in the world. Well, yeah, if you're going to define it as having two types, then you're making a definition that says it's this or it's that. And so we can actually do some, some derivations where you can say, OK, if we say that this reaction is happening happening at the same temperature, which is a, an assumption, but it's not that bad of an assumption mathematically. We can say that the change in entropy of the surroundings, let's just say this, the surroundings are not changing any chemical bonds. And so the only change in entropy for the surroundings is going to be where if we add heat to the surroundings, things move faster. 
And if they move faster, they have more entropy. And so we, we just have a definition for all of the surroundings. The, the entire universe is equal to the, the energy we put into the surroundings divided by the temperature. And you don't need this whole derivation here. I'm just showing you how we can say, OK, if we have delta S of the surroundings and delta S of the system, this sorry, delta S the universe is the system in the surroundings, we can actually define the surroundings in terms of the system because we can say whatever energy is lost by the system is going to the surroundings and increasing the entropy. And then if we take that and nobody likes fractions, if we can avoid them, so we just rearrange this and multiply both sides by negative T, we get this term, negative T times delta S of the universe is equal to enthalpy of the system minus temperature times entropy of the system. What we just did by doing that substitution that seemed kind of basic, didn't seem like it was helping us that much. We just defined the entropy of the universe in terms of two things we can measure based on the chemistry. We can look at the reaction that's happening and we can measure delta H for the system and we can measure delta S for the system. So now all of a sudden we have a way to predict whether the entropy of the universe is increasing based just on the chemical reaction. We usually write it as delta G. This term, negative temperature times delta S of the universe is defined as delta G, this is Gibbs free energy, is negative temperature times delta S of the universe. And if delta G is negative, that means that the entropy of the universe is positive. Change in entropy of the universe is positive because there was that negative term in there. So that means anytime delta G is less than zero, a reaction is spontaneous. And then I'll freak, I will frequently break this up into the two pieces. Delta H was our bond energy, right? And delta S is the entropy of the system. So we have the, the entropy piece and the bond energy piece. And these can be, if we put these two pieces together, they're always going to tell us if a reaction is spontaneous or not. So let's look at a possibility here. We have this reaction. This is called a molecule called 1,3-butadiene. And this is a molecule called ethene. This reaction is exothermic. We can look at the bond energies. We can actually get a number for it as far as being exothermic. We can also just look at the sheer number of molecules on each side and say, OK, we're going from two molecules to one molecule that's making things more ordered, right? We have fewer different ways we can arrange things if we are going from two molecules to one molecule. I mean, think of it just in terms of flipping coins. If I have two coins, I can flip. There are four possible outcomes. Heads, heads, head, tails, tails, heads, tails, tails. If I go to only one molecule, that's like flipping only one coin. There's, I just cut my number of possibilities in half. So this would be, the system would be losing entropy, but it's exothermic. So this first piece of the, of the equation, we can say is going to favor the reaction being spontaneous at any temperature. This second piece favors not being non-spontaneous. So how do we know if this reaction will happen or not? It all depends on temperature. Because if the temperature is big enough, then this piece, the unfavorable piece, gets bigger. If the temperature is low, then the favorable piece is going to be bigger. 
right? If t is small, then this whole chunk of the equation gets small, which means the dominant piece is delta h. If t gets big, then we're going to wind up fit with this favoring being non-spontaneous. The other way of thinking about this is high temperatures always favor the side of the reaction with a higher entropy. So we have two choices, high entropy, and low entropy. High temperature favors this side. Low temperature favors this side. Right? So at high temperature, you will always favor the high entropy side because this chunk gets bigger. And we will we'll go ahead and stop there for now. And we will pick back up at the beginning of lab for a few minutes because we just need to get to this equation for lab. You're going to actually calculate K for ring flips for cyclohexane based on energies of the two different conformers. Right, so we'll talk about that for a few minutes at the beginning. We almost got there today and we can do a few practice problems too. Um, but uh, yeah, we're good for right now. Any questions for our, before we stop for now? Let that marinate then. And